Praise God. Good morning, Reflection Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Yes. Let the joy of the Lord fill this place. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you. Lord, we're coming into this house with a heart of gratefulness. Thank you, God, for all that you are doing in our lives. We want to come in. We don't know... We don't know what to expect from you this morning, but we can expect because you are a God who blesses. You are a God who pours into us. You are a God who loves us. You are a God who wants to show yourself to us. And we thank you, oh Lord. We thank you, Father God, for your hand. And we thank you most importantly, Father God, for your beautiful heart. And today we come together in this place to worship you and to lift your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Everyone shout amen. Because that so be it. Hallelujah. Our God is great and glory. Put our trust in your name, Jesus. Able to save and deliver us. We put our hope in your name, Jesus. Blessing and honor, glory and power come to our God forever.
His name is Jesus. And in it, um, we're declaring that his name is wonderful. And for a few weeks, months, the word wonderful has been heavy on my heart. Like I needed to dive into the word wonderful. So I texted the pastors last night because I was just in the song, in the word wonderful, and I just went into this deep dive of what wonderful is. So I'm going to read it because I, I, that's the only way I can explain it. So it makes sense, hopefully. So it says, lately the word wonderful has been on my heart to reference to, in reference to Jesus. I've been telling myself I need to search this word. To me, it didn't have much meaning besides the superficial meaning of something just being wonderful. Last night, I went to a deep dive of this word and how powerful this word is. In the song we're about to sing, we declare his name is wonderful. And I couldn't accept what I thought I knew about wonderful to describe Jesus. Because in, because in this song, we are declaring his name. And it has to mean more than we say his, his, he is wonderful. Wonderful is incomprehensible. It's a presence. It's a moment where we get a glimpse of the Almighty. It's the awe-filled experience I get to have with him. And to me, it's this whirlwind moment in his presence. But it's so much more than my mind can comprehend. Because what I think is the most astonishing moment with Jesus is nothing in comparison to all that I don't see. To the infinite being that he is. He is wonderful. He is the word wonderful. A substance, a mind-blowing experience. In Judges 13, 18, why do you ask my name? The angel of the Lord replied, it is too wonderful to you, for you to understand. In Job 26, 14, these are just the beginning of all that he does, merely a whisper of his power. Who then can comprehend the thunder of his power? In Job 42, 3, you asked, who is that, who this, wait, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. So when we get into our quiet time and intimate moments with our wonderful God, don't let it just be a moment of acknowledging his presence. Allow it to be a moment of awe and wonder where we are filled with his presence, but also recognize there is so much more that we will never understand here on earth. But one day we will get the fullness when we are with him in eternity. So still seek him out. We may not be able to understand the fullness of him, he will, but he will still meet us in moments of surrender and praise and worship. He will still show up in situations that seem impossible for us. He still gives us that glimpse of all that he truly is. Wonderful counselor, almighty God. Amen.
Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. The Omnipotent. The Omnipotent. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. He is radiant. He is radiant. The Almighty God. He is Counselor. He is Counselor. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. Mighty God, He is mighty God, the omnipotent, the omnipotent, He is wonderful, He is wonderful, He is radiant, He is radiant, the Almighty God.
has always been a, a big part of my life. I've always related to music. And this song, if you allow the words to just seep into your heart, if you try and comprehend how big and how powerful Jesus is, then there's nothing in this world that can ever hurt you, affect you. Nothing in this world can ever bring you down. He is the God Almighty. He is our creator. He is the reason that we're here. He's the one that gave us breath this morning. When you start to acknowledge that, when you start to receive that, when you start to take that in and know the God that you serve is the God Almighty, the powerful, the, the, the everything, the everything. There is nothing in this world, no matter how big, no matter how bad you think it is, it's nothing compared to him. There's nothing that he can't do. He is the God of the impossible. So if you keep telling yourself, God, you got this. God, you got this. God, you got this. He will show up. He will show up. All you need to do is surrender. Surrender and give it to him. Don't give power to the world. Don't give power to people. Don't give power to situations. Don't give power to anything other than your God, the one that created you, the one that gives you your purpose, the one that gives you your identity. Give him the power. Don't stress about things that have nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your purpose. It has nothing to do with your story. Keep your eyes on God. Keep your eyes on the kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. But doesn't he say that? Believe that. So when you sing this song, when you hear these words and you hear the declaration of who Jesus is, receive that. Know that. Believe that. Trust that. This world has no power over you unless you give it power. Stop giving power to things that don't need power over you. Only God has power. Give it to him. Trust in him. Believe in him. I can't stress it enough to see people that are stressed and worried and concerned. Yes, those are natural things, fine. But don't dwell on that. Don't dwell on the stress. Don't dwell on the hurt. Don't dwell on none of it because God got you. He has your back. Just give it over to him. Surrender. Bow your knees and let him know, Lord, have your way. Do your will, not my own. I give my life to you. That's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. And you will look at situations differently. You will look at situations with ease, with nothing, because God has got your back. God has got your back. Look to him. Give him power. Give him the power. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. He is radiant. He is radiant. The Almighty God. Yes, you are Lord. He is Counselor. He is Counselor. He is mighty God. He is mighty God. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. The Omnipotent. The Omnipotent. Oh, He is wonderful. He is wonderful. He is radiant. He is radiant. The Almighty God. Only you, only you, Jesus. Bless your name. Name above all names. Bless your holy name.
the Spirit of God is moving in the place. And we give him space. We give the Holy Spirit space to move, to touch, to heal. That even in this moment, there's miraculous healing that can happen in the hearts and the lives of people. You claim it. You receive it. joke it's not a game we know the power of the spirit of God when it's in a place and it begins to hover and he's doing something and even if it's for just one person but I truly believe that it's for many hearts and for many lives we give you room we give you space of our God is that he can provide healing in a place in a time like this without us even knowing what we need. We thank you for you know our future and you know what we need. came in and we didn't have you in the right place, that we'd be able to put you in the right place right now, which is even more than just above, but in the middle. It's above and in the middle of everything. Be in the center of our lives, be in the center of our hearts, Lord, and above all things in our lives, Father. We place you in that place where you belong, your rightful place. Forgive us if we have missed that. Forgive us if we put anything else above you. But there is no other greater one than you. as a church, let's say together to God and repeat after me, thank you, God, for your love, for your greatness, for your beauty, for your provision, for your peace, for your joy, for never forsaking me, for always thinking of me, for always loving me, for your mercy, for your grace, for your goodness. And God, I love you. Amen.
into this time, our time of giving. We never come in just talking about giving, but we want to give thanks first. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for always just being so good to us and for knowing that you planted this ministry. This ministry is yours. And you have called us to work it. You have called us to manage it here but we don't manage it with our own mind and our own hands Lord it's always with you and through you but we thank you for all that you're doing in this house Lord I pray that we continue to move according to your guidance that we always be obedient to what you say and what you direct Lord we thank you for always always just showing yourself in mighty ways we thank you God for all that you're doing and that you have done. Lord, right now, as we come to a place and a time of giving, Lord, I pray for every giver. I pray for everything that comes into this house, Lord. Lord, I pray that you multiply it and that you use it, Father God, in a way to expand your kingdom so that we continue to reach those that are lost, that we continue to reach those that have been untouched or unreached. God, we thank you, Lord, for the teaching, for the discipleship, for the ministries, for the um, everything that comes and flows out of this place. Father God, I pray that it continues to flow and that it continues to flow like a, like a river to be able to just pour out, Lord, to reach all those that need to be reached. We ask you to use us, Father God, and we just thank you for all that is coming in today. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we say amen. There's multiple ways to give in the house. There's uh, QR codes on the chairs, and you can also give in-house. We have ushers. But do it with a joyful heart and knowing that this is good ground, that God is doing mighty and great things um, in this place. And there will be some things that we'll be sharing later on um, in the service about some things coming up that um, you can always just pray for, pray for, continue to pray for every area of ministry in this house. The homeless ministry, the feed my sheep, the children's ministry, the, the worship team, the tech team, the people who serve, continue to pray over the men's groups, the women's groups. There's just so many things that go on um, and and the Bible studies that, that, that are continuously taking place, just so many things. It all needs prayer. It all needs God's prayer. And so continue to pray um, over everything that is moving in this house. Amen. was in conversation yesterday with my son he was talking to a group of his friends and they were just intrigued and they were asking questions about God 
and I'm listening, and he's showing me the text message, and I'm seeing the conversation and, and the questions that they ask. And their thought of what church is, it is so far off. And the only reason why they think church is supposed to be the way they think it is is because that's what the church has displayed. The church has displayed that church is just a building. Oh, it's a place that you just come together. They were asking, because my son will hit them with, uh, it's, it's a kingdom. And they're like, what? It's a kingdom. He's like, how do you see the kingdom here on earth? And one kid was like, oh, you build a cathedral, you build a building. And I was like, no, it's not that. But they don't know because the church hasn't been teaching what kingdom is, what structure is, what the Bible, what the Bible is called us to do and to be here on the earth. I'm just going to go on a, on a thought here. So we seek all these things to try to figure out what church is supposed to be. Every single person in this building has done it. We all have done it. What, is, what do we think church is? And okay, I think that's what, that's what it is. I got to go on Sunday. Um, um, for some people, oh, I got to pay my tithes. Uh, some people, you know, I got to confess. I got to do, everybody has their own thoughts before they get exposed to what the kingdom is like. So basically what that does is sets and builds religion in your heart. Because religion is man's attempt to find God. Religion is man's attempt to establish a way on how they can please and reach God. It's man's attempt to do different acts to be approved by God. And all the time, the standard that is set to be in right standing with God, it was another man setting the standard, not God himself. So that's what religion teaches. It teaches us to chase, to be good before God's eyes. When none of us, none of our deeds are good. So God himself comes in instead of us having to search. Why do we search for things? Because we feel something is lost. Why do we search for the things of God? Why do we search these things? Because we feel something is lost. And the reality, the reality of it is this. It is not lost. It is there for you to discover, but you only discover it not through a religious act, not by certain things that you do. Oh, you know, uh, I, I go out and help uh, my next door neighbor mow her yard because she you know, doesn't have the power to do it. So that's a good act. I do that. You know, I don't steal from anybody. I don't, I, don't, I don't cheat. I don't lie. I don't do these things. That is man trying to please God in an area that God is saying, that is good. But that is a byproduct of being in right standing with him. That is a byproduct. If I'm in right standing and I'm in relationship with God, all those things, I don't have to think about it. I automatically don't steal. I automatically stop lying. Because what happens is this. God came for this purpose right here, to restore the image of his children. So we don't belong to a religion. We belong to a country. And that country is called heaven. We belong, our citizenship is in heaven. And God gives us the opportunity to come here on earth to display his country here. To display his goodness here. His glory does not come to the earth unless it comes through us. All right. I'm going to lose some of you guys on this turn right here. Because we often say this, God is in control. God is in control. God is in control. If God is fully in control, you would have stopped doing what he was doing in your life, what, what, what you're doing in your own life. If God was fully in control, you would stop doing the thing that doesn't please God. Because he automatically would say, all right, you're, they're done doing that. But what God does is this. He equips you to stop the thing that keeps you far from God. So when he died on the cross, he broke the power of the influence that takes you away from him. The greatest... Ah, in the garden, sin was not the greatest thing working there. Sin needed assistance to get into the world. 
Sin needed someone else to give you the influence to do what was wrong in God's eyes. It came through a tempter. It came through Satan. It came through him. I don't know if you guys have been to church. They don't talk about Satan. You need to talk about it. We not, let us not focus on him, but we need to talk about him because he is real. And the Bible says that he is subtle and more craftier than any being out there. He's been around before you. He's been around before your great-great-grandmother was around. He's been around since the day Adam and Eve were in the garden. So he knows a thing about patterns. He can look at your life and see the pattern of your life and know exactly how to keep you in that pattern that is, that's opposite of God. The algorithms. <laughs> he can look at your whole family history and say, his granddaddy was a drunk, so all I got to do is tempt him with some alcohol and the rest just sets off. His mama was always angry. So all I got to do is just give him the opportunity to take on that seed of anger and the rest of the lineage. Why is it so... Ah. The Holy Spirit help me with this. Why is it so difficult for us just to, just to surrender to God? Because we are internal minded instead of eternally minded if that makes sense we take this small portion that we live here on the earth and we make it a lifetime of hurt we take one incident that happens in our lives and we dwell in that for the rest of our lives when all of eternity is still waiting. So we take all the stuff that happens to us here and we start to worry about it. We build anxieties about it and we continue to dwell in it when God is saying your life is nothing but a vapor. If we really look at it, our life is just this big compared to what eternity is. This is not original with me. This was original with, uh, I think, Francis Chan or something like that. Anybody got a belt? I don't want to take mine off. Anybody got a belt I can use? A rope, a belt, something? Make sure your pants don't fall. <laughs> tight pants. He said, he said tight pants. <laughs> Brother Christian, can you come here? Some of you guys have probably seen this. I'm freestyling with the Holy Spirit right now. Just stretch it out. So let's say this is all of eternity, and it keeps going. It kind of has a point, an arrow, right? Yeah. yeah, it keeps going. This is your life. Let's bring it up. This is your life right here, this buckle part. So we worry about what happens in this small section here when we have all this to go. And to continue. Lord, how am I going to pay my bills? Trust in him. Lord, I don't have a job. Trust in him. Lord, I'm struggling with anxiety. What does the word say about anxiety? Do not be anxious for anything. But it also tells us that when we surround ourselves with good company, anxiety breaks. And he tells us to be where the body of Christ. So the only thing you have to be concerned, not worry, concerned about is if I'm in the right position so all these things can break and I can live without anything hindering me in this small part of life. You guys with me? This ain't for me. This is for you. I understand this principle. So I'm not going to make decisions based upon what I see here. I'm going to anchor myself in heavenly things. So when things come here, storms come, I'm anchored and I'm not thrown in the waves. And matter of, if I'm anchored, that means I'm stabilized. Things are going to happen here. We can't avoid that. 
But if my hope is in the Lord, if my future is in him, if my identity is in him, in him all these things can happen here. But it doesn't matter. Let's point it this way. Thank you. This is our life down there. But we're anchored in heavenly places. Come on, I'm trying to help somebody here. We're anchored in heavenly places. So again, winds can blow, storms can come, uh, foreclosure notices can come. All that stuff can come, but it doesn't matter because I'm anchored in heaven. I can lose some things here on earth, but I don't want to lose anything that heaven has for me. And there are some things, this is brother, before his pants fall off. So, so we've been preaching, let's get growing. Let's grow. Let God allow you the ability to see in how you're supposed to grow. There's no such thing as a person that says they are connected to the body of Christ and there's zero growth. There's no such thing um, in the process without any progress. That's a word right there. And we have to get away from elementary speech. We have to get away of just saying religious words. Because words like salvation can become a religious word if you don't know exactly what salvation is. Because the word salvation doesn't mean just I'm saved. God has saved me. I'm not going to hell. Yes, that's part of it. But salvation, what it really means is that you're delivered and preserved. What are you delivered from? You're delivered from sin. You're delivered from anxiety. You're delivered from depression. You're delivered from everything that this world is trying to attach to you. Delivered and preserved. That means you're put in a place that he is going to preserve you. The easiest way I can put it is this way. I buy some meat at the grocery store, but I'm not going to eat it this week. So where do I put it? I put it in the freezer. Because it's preserved. But if I don't put it in the freezer, just leave it on the counter and say, I'll eat it next week. Guess what happens? I'm eating some stuff that wasn't supposed to be attached to me. So why are we eating in places that are not preserved by God? Why are we visiting places, entertaining things that have not been delivered by God? Because my Bible says a double-minded man is tossed like the waves. A double-minded man is not anchored in heaven. And a double-minded man cannot please God. This is for you. And the Bible also says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Let me tell you what that means. I can't go with you if I don't agree with you. Plain and simple. If this brother tells me, hey, well, I'm going to Universal, well, I don't want to go to Universal. I'm not going with him. But he says, hey, I'm going to Universal, and I say, oh, I like Universal. I'm going to go with you. I'm agreed. I'm going with him. So you're either going to be one-minded with God or one-minded with the world. And the world has the same way the kingdom has order and structure, so does the world. Satan is relentless. He is relentless to the point that he knows he's defeated, but he doesn't care. He's still going to do it. Now let's flip it to the saints. Are we relentless enough that even if it looks like defeat, we know we had the victory? I got one come on, a hand clap, and a hallelujah. That was good news. That's the news of the kingdom. That is the gospel of the kingdom. Because in this world, it's always going to present to you lack. But in the kingdom, there is no lack. Imagine serving a broke king. It makes no sense. When we think about a king, we think about royalty. We think about possessions because there's no such thing as a king without territory. And the heavens is the Lord's. 
The earth is the Lord's. But, but he delegated to us rulership over the earth. He said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion. Let them have authority because we throw that word out too. Yeah, I have dominion. Do you have authority? Has God assigned authority to you? Because if God hasn't assigned authority to you, you don't have dominion. Let us make man our image and our likeness and let them have authority. So he set the standard. He said, the one who is supposed to have authority is the one that looks like me. The one that has authority is the one that looks like me and operates like me. The one that has authority, people have a hard time distinguishing if it's me or if it's them. Can I throw something? See me, I'm paying attention. I say things like that just to see who's paying attention. So we've been talking about growing up. And we've been in what book? All right. We've been in Hebrews for, I think, more than two months right now. And the book of Hebrews is coming to a point that only the mature can be able to grasp it. And this is the point that I'm, I've been, I'll be honest with you. I'm like, Lord, how do I preach this thing? Because it would be so much easier if everybody was at the spiritual level that it needs to be at. So, Lord, how do I preach this thing to where... I don't drown those that are in the kiddie pool by bringing them out to a place they can't swim. But how do I preach this thing in a way that those that like to swim in the deep will get bored because they're in the kiddie pool? So I asked the Holy Spirit to help me out with this. And I ask you this. That if something goes over your head, get in your word. If something, you say, I'm not understanding this. Go to somebody that you know that can help you understand it. Don't leave a church service confused. Because God is not an author of confusion, not an author of, of chaos. He has order. But you can have... Jesus himself preaching up here, and it won't mean a thing unless you receive what Jesus is preaching. Jesus preached to thousands of people. But the day he was on the cross, only one disciple was there. And the, the women were there too. It's amazing. It amazes me that that the women were there and only one of the disciples were there. And he had some tough dudes. He had one dude cutting somebody's ear off. He had another one dude called a zealot, which was a trained assassin. He had some dudes. He had some fishermen. But when they got tough, they were gone. And there's no shot at men. I'm just saying this is what happens. That he, they had the greatest preacher of all time. They had the greatest teacher of all time. They had God himself with him. And they still found a way to run away. So it's not about who can preach the best. It's about can you receive from the best. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. I don't know where I put my Bible. It's right here somewhere. We're going to go down. Go down to almost the last verse. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Perfect. This hope we have, go up a little bit. I want to tell them what this hope is. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. Who are the heirs of promise? See, this is the thing, this is what I'm talking about. Not everybody knows that they're the heir of promise. Because when somebody says, who are the heirs of promise? You should be proud about that. I'm the heir of promise. That is me. God has made us a promise. He has made a covenant with us with greater promises let me give you the real about a covenant in the old testament a covenant was not made unless blood was shed in the old testament it wasn't a covenant 
until something died. Until something was ripped in half, it was an animal, and two people agreed upon the conditions of the covenant. So they will often take a lamb, cut it right in half. It's a bloody mess. And there's blood everywhere, and there's this animal in two. And one person will stand over here, and the other person, part of the covenant, will stand over there. And they'll go over the covenant that they're making. And then the two will go through the center of that cut animal in the blood, go through it, representing this. That if I fail to uphold my end of the covenant, whatever happened to that animal, let it happen to me. That is covenant. So here we go. We fast forward to Jesus Christ on the cross. He is called the Lamb of God because he was supposed to be a sacrifice. He was a sacrifice. So if he's going to make a greater covenant, and if he's going to make a covenant with us, what needs to happen according to how I described covenant just now? Blood must be spilt. So this is why Jesus was broken. It says that he was unrecognizable by the time they got done with him. Because he had to be broken for every single drop of blood of him to come out. To the point that when they stabbed him on the side, it wasn't even blood that came out. It was water. And I'm not in the medical field, but I heard somebody say this one time. That only happens when the heart just... So if you had to put a, 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 a reason of... of, of reason of death, they were said that Jesus died of a broken heart. Because he came to his own, and his own did not recognize him. He came to his own and tried to deliver them, and they didn't accept what he was bringing to the point that they want to kill him. Ain't it funny when, the, when people talk about things being right, it offends people? And the Bible warns us, as the days get closer to the end, they're going to call good evil and evil good. That is happening now. And I am worried about this country going into this election. Because every election year tests the body of Christ. I'm going to tell you this right now. Don't you lose a family member over a party. Don't you lose a friend over a party. Because at the end of the day, they're only there for a short time. So you're going to make an eternal judgment, an eternal decision based on somebody who's going to have office for four years to eight years the most. See, but when we're kingdom minded, we know that our opinions don't matter. When was the last time Jesus came to you and said, you know what? What do you think if I uh, stop being king? He's not going to ask you that. When it was the last time Jesus said, you know what, we're going to have an election. You guys got a chance to vote me out. Never going to happen. Because you can't vote out a king. You can't vote out a king. And then a king does this. He has heirs. A promise. So whatever Jesus has, and I'm not going to tell you because I need you to find that out for yourself. Whatever Jesus has, whatever the Father said, this is yours. This is my son who I'm well pleased, and this is what he has. He has ownership and rulership over this. Whatever he has, his heirs will have as well. Because the Bible says that we're co-heirs with Christ. I'll ask you this one. What is Jesus lacking? So what does that say about you? What, you? what should you be lacking? But where do you find how to live a life of no lack? In the kingdom. Because in the kingdom, again, is a government. And it's the government's job. It is the king's job to make sure his people are doing well. The greatest countries are the countries where their people are doing well. And they're not being suppressed. And this is what God wants for all of us. He wants us to partake. This king is different. 
He doesn't want to take from you. He wants to add to you. So why do we put our trust in an earthly system when we have a heavenly system that oversees everything else and it's greater? We just say, your name is Jesus. And then we say things like, Jesus, no other name is greater than the name of Jesus. But then we don't believe it by our actions. Your actions and your fruit will determine if you truly trust God. Because in order for a tree to produce fruit, it has to be planted. And it has to remain planted. You cannot uproot it and keep uprooting it and keep uprooting it. Because what happens when you keep uprooting a plant or a tree, it causes trauma to the tree that eventually it will die off. So the same thing with us. And I'm rooted in Christ. Uh, today I'm not rooted. Tomorrow I'm rooted. Today I'm uprooted. Uh, you got to remain. It is easy to say a prayer of salvation, but it is harder to remain. I had a brother who said that yesterday. Ron, shout that out. What are you, I told you to write it down. What was it you said? It is hard to remain in God. Why is it hard? And it shouldn't be hard. After a while, it should not be hard. It's hard in the beginning because we don't know any better. But after a while, after a year, after two years, after three years, after four years, I'm still struggling with the things of keep me outside of the will of God. Come on, church. We have resurrection power inside of us. That alone tells us I have no lack. But am I rooted? Am I rooted? Am I anchored? See, roots go down, and anchors do too, but not our heavenly anchor. Our heavenly anchor goes up. And the great thing about, not, but an anchor, you don't see an anchor. How many been on cruises? You guys ever say, ever go to the, the workers or the captain? Hey, can I see your anchor? <laughs> I love what you offer. I love the destination you're going. But how's your anchor? <laughs> you just trust it. You just trust that the one you're following knows what he's doing. So the same way is this. We have to trust the one that we're following knows what he's doing. How do you trust somebody? Somebody asked me the other day, I was talking to, to, to an individual. He says, how do people follow other people? What makes, what makes people want to follow certain people? I said, because their track record. And he should have asked me, why should people listen to your message? Why should people... Listen to you when you talk about leadership. I said, because of track record. What does that mean? That the person over time has displayed who they are. He's been doing this. Jesus has been doing this for over 4,000 years. 6,000 years. Before the foundations of the earth. For all eternity. He's been doing it. He was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. How much more of a track record do you need to actually surrender and follow him here today? What else does he have to prove? What else does he have to show? And I get it. Sometimes I say, God, show me a sign. Show me this. And Lord, he has shown so many things over the course of humanity that what else do we need to surrender? You guys all right? Because this is for you. Who wants to grow? You don't stop growing. You never get to a point that you will stop growing. Well, I can't wait to get to heaven. You'll learn there too. And don't get too comfortable with heaven because you were never created for heaven. That's religion. 
How do I know that? Pastor, how can you say we weren't created for heaven? Where were you born at? Because when God creates something, he places in the place where it's going to flourish. We get to visit heaven. If you were to leave here today and you trust and Jesus is Lord, you get to visit heaven. But don't get comfortable there. Because the Bible says he's creating a new earth. Don't know. Don't ask me, what does that look like? I don't know. The Bible ends. That leaves you on a cliffhanger. See, God knew. He knew that. So you see, you think shows knew how to do cliffhangers. God knew it. He's like, listen, I'm going to give him enough. And then the, the show ends. So you want to make sure you get there to know what the rest of the story, where the next part of the story goes. It's not like God ran out of ideas. It's like, all right, New York, heaven, earth. Oh, what are we going to do after that? We'll find out when they get here. No. You know how I know our God doesn't operate like that? Because God said that before the foundations of the earth, you were already created. When did he create the foundations of the earth? In the beginning. How far back was that? We don't know. But I'm here now. So he said before he laid the foundations of the earth, he already had the plans for me in my life. He already knew that you would be here today. He already knows when you were going to enter the earth. He already knew when your mom and dad were going to hook up. Come on. He knew all these things already. Why don't we trust him? You see, when God does a thing, he starts at the end, and then he comes back to the beginning to get it started. This is why the Holy Spirit is a guide. How can you follow a guy that doesn't know where he's going? See, he knows where your destiny is, is, is in and where you're supposed to go. But he doesn't force you to follow the path. The path has been laid out for us. We get to choose if we're going to get on that right track or we're going to go left or we're going to go right. I said this a couple of weeks ago and I'll say it again. The Bible says this. That if a man puts his hands to the plow, when you're plowing, you have to go in a straight line. Because what plowing does, it, it breaks up the ground so for, you, for you to put seed in it. Florida's a great example of it. You see, everybody see uh, orange groves? All those trees are in line. All those trees are in line. Because somebody plowed and laid the seeds in that line, in that row. But if a man puts his hands to the plow, and starts going forward, and then gets distracted, and starts looking this way, wherever your head goes, your body will follow. And there'll be evidence of it. Imagine, we went to an uh, orange grove, and there's just trees all over the place. I don't know anything about agriculture, but I know that is wrong. I'm like, who'd you hire for this thing? I wonder. Was it Stevie? Y'all yeah, catch that later. Bring it back. So the Bible tells us that we have to remain in this course. We have to remain on this path. We have to remain, remain, remain with our eyes focused on our creator. Because outside of him, nothing is worth it. Nothing is worth it. I'm trying to I'm, hope this is helping you grow. Thus God determining to show more. He is determined. That he will show you more. But you have to be in his image and his likeness. Why? Because we're heirs. How is he going to identify who his children are if they don't look like him? How am I going to release the promise? How am I going to release the blessing? He set the standard himself. Those that look like me, those that carry my image and my likeness are deserving of the promises that I have for them. So all he has to do is look. And say, you ain't my son, who are you? 
My sons look like this. My daughters look like this. They carry themselves like this. They uphold the righteousness of the kingdom. They know my voice. And the voice of a stranger, they won't follow. What do we tell our kids when they grow up? You better not listen to no stranger. If a stranger tells you something, you do not tell them. They say, hey, you little kid, you want candy? You better not. We tell them what? We tell them things like stranger danger. God is saying the same thing here this morning. Don't listen to the strange voice. But how do you know it's a strange voice? Because you've been around the real voice long enough to know that the voice of a stranger I can't follow. We have a bunch of kids here today. And if I were to tell one of them to yell out mommy or daddy, I bet you you'll be able to pick out your kid. Because you know their voice. Now, if we do the experiment the other way around, I don't know if that'll. Sister Jeanette just whistles. Her kids know. <laughs> I was in my office. I heard the whistle. Right. <laughs> your kids know your voice. But do you know the voice of your daddy? My old pastor used to say, man, whenever you're in, if, if any of you guys are in trouble, about to do something wrong, I hope you hear my voice. He used to say that. And some people said, man, I hear you telling me not to do that. Because he's a shepherd. So sometimes the voice of God is going to sound like the voice of your shepherd. If your shepherd hears from God. If your shepherd speaks the way Listen, I should be able to go to you if you're mature and hear God. The other day somebody said, Mateus was talking. My son Mateus was talking and they thought it was me. I was like, no way. I was like, man, he sounds just like his dad. Who do we sound like when we talk today? Who do we sound like? Can they identify you by your sound? And our Father is looking to deliver the promises. But there are sometimes he has a promise for us, but our sound doesn't line up with the promise. And he can't release it because the sound that you're making will destroy what he's trying to do. Abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability. There we go. That word be getting me. Immutability of his counsel, his counsel, his counsel, his counsel, his counsel. Why are we going to people for counsel that has no track record of what you're trying to get out of them? I'll say it. I'll say it again. I'll say it this way. If you're struggling in your relationship, why are you going to go to somebody who has no relationship at all? To you. I thought I was talking about physical, earthly relationship. I'm talking about relationship with God. If you're struggling with your relationship with God, why are you going to go to somebody who doesn't have a track record of being in relationship with God? So what happens when you do that, you go to somebody who does not have a relationship with God, but you're going to them to see how do I get a better relationship with God. What you're going to get is their opinion on how they think they reach God. Instead of going to God himself to see, God, how do I get closer to you? I'll give you a plain one. You're struggling with an addiction. You're struggling with, with pornography. You're struggling with being faithful. You're struggling with all these things. You're struggling with somebody. You're struggling with, with in your marriage. So you go to somebody who, who can't hold a marriage themselves, but you go to them for advice. But that's my grandma. That's somebody I know. That's somebody I trust. Maybe you do trust them, but you can't trust them in that area. Grandma ain't got no victory. <laughs> I'll leave our well alone. <laughs> Confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolidation 
who have fled for refuge to lay hold of hope set before us. Try to get somewhere. This hope we have as an anchor of our soul, both short and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil. I'm going fast through this because I preached this last week. Where the forerunner has entered for us. A forerunner becomes a forerunner with the hope that he'll have people following him. He runs ahead. Leading the way, trailblazer, going before everybody else, leading how it's supposed to be done, laying down foundation so that you can walk right behind it. So Jesus went out. He became the forerunner. Having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. A couple of chapters before that, we introduced Melchizedek. It was up to you to read up on him for me to lay the rest of this down for you. Give me five minutes to do something here. We're going to the deep water. Don't try to go in the deep water if you haven't mastered the kiddie pool. That sounds hard, right? But those that go to the deep water, don't forget those that are in the kiddie pool. I think that ends and goes chapter 7. It's taken us nine weeks to get to chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God is going to make room for some of y'all to catch up. I'm going to bring out a principle here, but it's time for you guys to catch up. Time to grow up. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So Abraham went out to rescue his, his nephew Lot. His nephew Lot got, was captured. Um, he got wind of it. He's like, you know what? We have to go out there and rescue him. What did Abraham do? We, oh, this is all coming full circle. Abraham picked 318 men from his own household, trained men that he can trust and he knew he can do battle with. Abraham had thousands of people with him, but he only picked 318 because he's like, for this assignment, I can only trust these people who are trained in this specific area. How does that look like today? It looks like this. I cannot get in front with some, I can't tell somebody, come with me to this house over here because we're going to pray in this house if you don't have a prayer life yourself. You have no track record. That when you walk into a place, demons start to tremble. So why will I take you somewhere? In fact, I can't take you somewhere. If I love you, I need to protect you because you're not ready yet. Doesn't mean I don't love you. It just means I can't take you with me. You're not equipped for that. If you have a five-year-old and you need to go on a road trip and that's the only other person that's around you, you're going to say, hey, it's a long road trip. It's about 48 hours. At some point, I need to switch drivers. I need you to come with me. I need you to be that driver. No, you wouldn't do it. Because that person's not equipped, although you love them. So Abraham, after he went and rescued his, his nephew Lot, says the slaughter of kings, rescue his nephew Lot, he goes to this man named Melchizedek. Next verse. To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Leave it there. People have a hard time understanding this brother here because the Bible tells us that he has no beginning and no end. I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger. He has no beginning and no end. And people are like, is he Jesus? Is he this? Is he that? No, he is not Jesus. The Bible is clear about that. But you have to be clear about this. You cannot limit God's ability. He created Adam from the dust of the ground. He breathed his spirit into him. And we think because he did that with Adam one time that he's incapable of doing it again with somebody else. This is going to hurt some religious mindsets. Some of y'all catch it, some of y'all don't. It's okay. It's okay. King of righteousness and also king of Salem meaning king of peace. Next verse. 
without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. Is he Jesus? No. He is made like the Son of God. So in, all, in other words, he is made in the order of Jesus. He is made like the Son of God, but not according to, because he was on the earth before Jesus, before the word came here physically. Man, I got to teach this thing, but I can't do it right now the way I want to. I got to be obedient. Go back up. I'm going to quit right here. I said five minutes. So Abraham went, rescued his nephew, and they took everything from these kings. They took everything. And what did he do after he took everything? He said, I got to find me a priest. I got to find me a priest to give a tenth. But you guys have a hard time saying the body of Christ has a hard time giving a tenth into the kingdom. What was he doing? He came to a priest that has no beginning and no end, meaning he's eternal. So he is saying, I'm going to take a tenth and put it in an eternal place. I'm going to give it to an eternal priest so I can have an eternal blessing. Because if I give it to a priest that has a beginning and has an end, the blessing will end at some point. But if I give it to a priest who's outside of time, whatever he blesses with me, it's outside of time. It has no beginning. It has no end. And we think the church just wants your 10% because the church wants your money. No, the church is trying to get you to be in a blessed place. But the church ain't going to force you to do that. I'm not going to force you to do that. All I'm going to tell you is this. Do you want to be blessed? And so many times people pray, Lord, my resources. Lord, I pray for money. I pray for this. I you know, increase my pockets. Money is not a prayer. Money is an act of obedience according to the law of the tithe. If you release it, it'll come and chase you. There's so many messages going off in my head right now. You guys in. Joel, help them, please. I'm on an assignment. I'm on an assignment. And so are you. Everyone has an assignment. This ain't just for pastors. This ain't for just people who have titles. I leave you with this one. May you never take chase a title. Because if you have to chase a title, then it, most likely that wasn't the title that you need to be carrying. Not in the kingdom. In heaven and moving forward, the Bible doesn't talk about any about pastors. The Bible doesn't talk about apostles. It doesn't talk about evangelists, teachers, prophets. It doesn't talk about any of those things. Those things are needed for the now. Before Adam sinned, how many pastors did Adam have? How many worship leaders did Adam need? How many ushers were at his church? There was no need for that. The reason we had that now is because we've gotten so far away from the original plan of God. So we need that to teach people. God places the Holy Spirit in people and he gives giftings. He gives us pastors, he gives us evangelists, he gives us teachers, apostles, prophets. All those for what? For the edification of his body because the body doesn't know how the body's supposed to operate. Lord, speak to me. Yeah, I'm going to send somebody. Listen to them. That's how God operates nowadays. So, the greatest title that you can own, why do you want to own a title that has an expiration date? Yes, I'm a pastor and I'm honored to be a pastor because God is the one that called me to be a pastor. So I don't want to downplay that. and I, 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 It bothers me when when people say, well, I don't go by titles. Well, God gave you that title, so you better go by it. Because if people don't recognize the title, they, they will, they'll abuse you as, as a pastor. Or they won't receive 
what they need of you as a pastor. However you recognize, however you perceive a thing is how you receive from that thing. I'm going to stop right here before, I don't want to drown anybody. So the greatest title you can have is son. And when the Bible talks about son, it doesn't talk about gender. Son is a position in his family. Son is a position. But for the sake for, for your mind, before it blows up, sons and daughters. Child of God, let's put it there. Thank you, Margie. The greatest title that you can hold is child of God. And the second title that you can hold is citizen of heaven. Citizen of heaven. Child of God, citizen of heaven. Are you recognized as a child of God? Are you recognized as a citizen of heaven? Because when you're a citizen of heaven, that means you have structure and kingdom government in your heart. Seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. Seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. That verse is so powerful because it gave you the priority of your life right there. Seek a career first? Nope. Seek a title first? Nope. Seek a great house. Seek a great car. Seek this. All those stuffs are great. Amen if you have them. Amen. But I hope you need get them outside of God's will. Seek first the kingdom and its righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Whose job is to add it to you? It's his job. It's his job. It's his job. We don't own anything. We get to manage things for God. We don't own a thing. We get to manage. We become stewards of what he gives us. I feel like there was multiple messages here, but some of you guys operate that way. Take that home with you. I'm not ownership of anything. I get the honor to steward what God allows me to, to manage. Even your kids. They ain't yours. Before the foundations of the earth, he knew who they were. So who was their daddy first? They're not yours. It says children are a blessing. That means he gives you something. He blessed you with it. He just used you to release them here on the earth. For what purpose? To take ownership over them? No. To manage them. To show them the kingdom. To let them know how they're supposed to operate when they leave your house. Your children are supposed to leave your house. And start their own family. You guys had enough. Father God, thank you for this word.